Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, so this morning, I have a passage of scripture. We'll see what happens. <laughs> praise the Lord. Um, and it's a scripture, it's a passage I've read about, I don't know, I was looking for something in particular, and this isn't what I was looking for, but I just couldn't get away from it, so this is apparently what the Lord wants me to share this morning. It's from Zechariah chapter 4. It's a very familiar scripture. I think I've read it a dozen times. Apparently, this is still where the Lord is dealing with me and, and us at. About the candlesticks and the two olive trees. And the angel who taught, I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Bible. And the angel who talked with me came again and awakened me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. Iowa, oh sleepy one. And said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl for oil on the top of it and its seven lamps on it. And there are seven pipes to each of the seven lamps which are upon the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side of it, feeding it continuously with oil. So I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered me. When we ask, we get an answer, right? Do you know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said to me this, addition of the bowl to the candlestick, causing it to yield a ceaseless supply of oil from the olive trees is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel saying, not by power, I'm sorry, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit of whom the oil is a symbol, says the Lord of hosts. For who are you, O great mountain of human obstacles before Zerubbabel, who with Joshua had led the return of the exiles from Babylon and was undertaking the rebuilding of the temple before him, you shall become a plain, a mere molehill, and he shall bring forth the finishing gable stone of the new temple with loud shouting of the people crying, grace, grace to it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundations of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Then you shall know, you shall recognize, and you shall understand that the Lord of hosts has sent me his messenger to you. Who with reason despises the day of small things? For these seven shall rejoice when they see the plummet of the hand of Zerubbabel. The seven are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout the whole earth. And then I said to him, the angel who talked with me, What are these two olive trees on the right side of the lampstand and on the left side of it? And a second time I said to him, what are these two olive branches which are beside the two golden tubes or the spouts by which the golden oil is emptied out? And he answered me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two sons of oil, Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel the prince of Judah, the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of the whole earth as his anointed instruments. So there are a lot of things going through my mind as I read this, and there's so many parallels, and there's just so much of this as the new covenant, right? This is, to me, a representation of the new covenant of the eternal kingdom, and i got to figure out where I want to start here. <laughs> so there's these two trees um, in the river. So there's two trees in a river. That's the three, right? That's three. That's the the perfect number of the, the triune God. And then there's these bowls, right? And I believe that the Lord is saying that we are the bowls. And the, bowl, the whole purpose of the bowls is to have something to pour out the oil from. And if that isn't working, then what's the purpose of the trees in the river of oil? What's the purpose? If those bowls aren't flowing out, and that anointing, that Holy Spirit, that word of Zerubbabel is not being passed on, what's the point of having bowls? Right? That's the purpose of the bowls. We are the bowls. Our purpose is to let it flow from us, to let it flow from us. All I heard this morning, three words, pour it out. Lord, what do you want to say this morning? Pour it out. I need a little more than that, Lord. What do you want to say this morning? Pour it out. Pour it out. Pour it out. It does us no good to receive and receive and receive and receive and receive and receive and receive, and receive because our ability 
to speak to a mountain and watch it be cast into the sea. It's not, it's not for us. It's not in us. It's not, it's not about us. It's not about our mountains. It's about the mountains of human obstacles that stop the flow. Those are the mountains that we have the authority to speak to. Those are the things that we have authority over. And I mentioned it this morning, but there's a, there's a lot of crazy weather events right now. There's fires, there's hurricanes, there's earthquakes. Anybody, I don't know if anybody felt the earthquake tremors yesterday. We don't get earthquakes in Iowa. No. We don't get tremors in Iowa. There's fires, there's hurricanes. We are surrounded in the United States with these weather patterns. And I'll tell you what, I'm a big nerd. I studied meteorology, it was one of my favorite classes. All weather is is a transfer of energy. And I heard the Lord say so clearly this morning as I was thinking about it, if you won't do it, I will. If you won't do it, I will. There is a transfer of power. There is a transfer of energy. We are spirits. Our spirit is power. Spirit is energy. And if we won't pour it out to change this, this atmosphere, he will. And maybe it looks like a hurricane, and maybe it looks like an earthquake, and maybe it looks like a fire. Those things in the world, they destroy. But God wants to bring life. But he's saying, if you won't do it, I will. And you're not going to like it when I have to do it. I'm telling you, oh sleepy one, wake up. There is an angel trying to wake up and speak to you. There is an angel that is telling you, I am putting these people in front of you. I am putting these people in your lives. I am trying to give you dreams. I'm trying to give you visions. But you have to pour it out. You have to open your mouth and let the word of Zerubbabel come forth. And these mountains become molehills. I don't know if you can know, I, I'm not a big mole expert, but if there's a mountain, I've been to the mountains in Washington with my sister. I've hiked those suckers, and I can't walk for two days afterwards because they are huge. Yeah. But I can step on a molehill, and it's destroyed. Yeah. I can walk right over a molehill. I'm telling you, it is. there's a changing, there's a shaking, there is a burning, there is a, the wind is blowing, uh -huh. and we have got to become moles, and we have got to let it overflow. We have got to look for somewhere to pour it out. This river, this spirit, the truth, the grace of God does us no good if we aren't pouring it out. And I'm telling you what, if we want our circumstances to change, then, I, then find somebody to pray for with the same circumstance. Find somebody to pray for, to bless, to go and speak the word of Zerubbabel, to speak the living word, to speak grace to it. Grace, yell with shouting and celebration. Grace to it. Find a mountain. If it's not, if you can't speak to your mountain, if you're not getting anywhere with your mountain, then I say just ignore your mountain. Go find someone else's mountain to speak to, and your mountain's going to be gone. Yeah. It's going to be destroyed, not by power, not by might, but by his spirit. Yes. That is a promise to us. And I am tired of praying and seeing nothing happen. Amen. That is not how it's supposed to be in the kingdom. So I'm done praying for my circumstances. I'm done. I mean, I, I, I can't complain. I've, I've been blessed. But I'm... Pour it out. It's not about me. It's not about my circumstances. It's about who needs to be poured out on. Who needs to feel the love of God? Who needs to feel the acceptance? Because I'm telling you, the day I met Jesus Christ, I was at work. And someone said, I, I asked about a church, and, and a friend, a dear friend, if you guys know Darlene, I don't want to tell you about my church, I want to tell you about Jesus. Yes. Uh, and I felt yes. a love wash over me that I had never experienced in this world. I knew nothing. I grew up in a Baptist church full of great people. I knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. I knew nothing about a spirit-filled life. I knew nothing about any of that stuff, but I knew the second that I touched love and that love touched my heart. I knew it. And that's yes. what this world needs yes. to experience. Yes. Not church, not rules. Yes. The Lord has destroyed the physical temple. We have tried to make it about churches, about religions, about programs. It is about none of that. It is about love. Our God is love. He is a consuming fire. That love will destroy all the corruption of humanity, all of the flesh. That's a good thing. It's not about the church. It's not about us. It's about him yes. and his pure love. And when we will just let it flow, pour it out. That's all he wants to say this morning, church. Yes. 
let's agree together to pour it out. And when we're here, to pour it out on each other. And when we leave here, to pour it out on anybody that we come in contact with. Because I'm telling you, if we will take our eyes off of ourselves, we'll take our eyes off of the things that don't matter, and just trust that the mountains, people are going to, people, it always happens. I'm checking out at Fairway. This woman, I don't know how we had a 20-minute conversation about how good the Lord is. I don't even know how that happened. At Fairway. I, I think I just said, I just was coming home from church last night, and boy, you could feel the change in the weather. Well, let me tell you, God is good. I said, you know what? He is. And we talked about it for 20 minutes. And there were five people behind us in line, and they heard about how good God was. Yes, exactly right. But I'm telling you, people will come, and then there'll be people who will stop you in the parking lot and say, hey, I heard you talking about Jesus. I've always wondered. What do we have to give them? We have a whole lot. I don't care what your, your world looks like. I don't care what your life looks like. I don't care what your home looks like. I don't care what kind of car you drive. I don't care what your job is. I don't care where you are in life. I don't care how old you are. Yes. You have something so precious. You have the one thing that will stand forever to give and to share. Amen. Life. Yeah. Eternal life. And that's all that really matters. Yes. In Amen. Jesus' name. Seen it. Yes, that's they right. read about it, 
2,000 yeah. years ago, yeah. you know? And those people that had great things that happened, but they hadn't seen it. And this world's going to have to see it. Yeah. And God's going to do it. Yeah. He said for his name's sake, he would do it. Yeah. You know, we think, Lord, where are you? Where are you? You're right. He's there all the time. He is. And in his time, which I look and think, well, I'm 70, and I hope your time and my time is close by. <laughs>
then what's it worth to trade your life? Why would you want to hold on to something that's crushed? What if you were so possessed by God that it didn't matter what people said about you? God has given you dominion by His Spirit that every place the sole of your foot treads is yours. God grabbed your heart, not for you to be bound by the fear of man anymore, but for you to be possessed by the love of God. And if God is for you, who cares who's against you?
before, before the Lord comes and, and he is coming and yes. we are anticipating and you know getting excited and so forth. And uh, but uh, he was all right and it seemed like his uh, foundations and so forth were too. But uh, uh, you know the end times is so uh, prevalent of uh, the things that are happening.
for requests for testimonies, yeah. Um, I'd like to have Sarah for my brother to be interviewed for Let's stand and let's go to the Lord this morning. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just came before you this morning. Jesus, we are. Thank you, Lord. Thank you as you reveal the hidden, hidden wisdom for this time, Lord. Thank you that you brought us together today, Lord. Thank you for those members of our body who are not here now. You've heard their requests today, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. That you would heal. You would heal. Thank you, Lord, that you would restore. Thank you, Lord, that you make all things new, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and your revelation that you pour out. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We turn to you this morning, Lord. We look to you, Lord. Have your way in this service today, Lord. Stir up the gifts, Lord. Stir up the gifts, Lord. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, Lord, but more importantly, boldness to speak. Your word is alive. It lives in our hearts, Lord. But it's of no effect unless it's spoken, unless the ears can hear. Give us boldness to encourage each other. Give us boldness to share the wisdom and revelation that you impart to each one of us. Stir up the gifts in this body, Lord. Stir up the gifts in your church, in the body of Christ, that we might minister to each other, but more importantly, we might minister to a lost and a dying world, Lord, who just Lord. needs to know that you love them, that you died for them, for each one of us, Lord, for whosoever will, Lord that you accept us and love us just as we are. No strings attached, nothing expected in return, just to receive your grace, to receive your love and trust in you. Whatever we carried in here today, Lord, we laid at your feet. We were not created to carry burdens. We were not created to carry these yokes that we strap ourselves down with, Lord. We lay them at your feet today and we walk in freedom. We walk in newness of life. We walk in purpose and in liberty. Set free that our cups overflow with joy and peace and love and all the fruit of the Spirit, Lord. That you pour out, that you freely give. We are blessed and highly favored, chosen to be children of the High King. We are one with you, Lord. There is no end and no beginning to us, Lord. We are knit together as one body to function, to reveal Christ, to reveal your resurrected life to this world, Lord. Everywhere we walk is holy ground because you are there. Everywhere we go, the darkness flees as you light up this world, Lord, one step at a time, wherever we go. Jesus, set the captives free. Bind up the brokenhearted, Lord. Let the blind eyes see and let the deaf ears hear. Lord, there are Lazaruses in the caves, Lord, who stink, who are dead and buried and stink, but there is life to be spoken, that they may rise again in newness of life. Let us see the resurrection power. Let us trust and know and be bold in the resurrection power, Lord. You have made us to be fearless. Fearless. Fearless, Lord, because your perfect love casts out all fear. We have nothing to be afraid of. Who can stand against you, Lord?
your way in this service this morning. Would you bless everybody here? As we say, grace, grace to it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Just a reminder that if you brought your cell phone with you this morning to so please turn it in silent mode. And Eastern Gate House of Prayer. We know what you meant. We know what you meant. We know what you meant. For those who missed last month, uh, <laughs> we're going to do a do over. Yeah, I don't have a date check in there. So, yeah, a week from this, a week from this, what is this, this Friday? Friday. This, this is Friday. Friday. This Friday. Don't mind me. Uh, just come next Friday. <laughs> As the Lord leads. Yeah, there you go. Blame it on him. Yeah, it's, he'll lead you. <clears throat> anyway, um, <clears throat> we've been walking in anointing for years. The Lord will work through people, as Suzanne was talking about earlier, uh, through men and by the uh, means of anointing. Um, when his glory shows up, it has nothing to do with anointing. It's beyond anointing. His glory is his presence and doesn't need man. So if we aren't willing to reveal the anointing and release the anointing he has put on him, he's going to show up and it's going to get really ugly. Um, I've seen it time and time again. Um, I pray for both. I pray for the bride to rise up and walk in her full anointing and to release glory and to release glory, mm -hmm. which will have nothing to do with man, mm -hmm. but will just draw his presence in. Um, Friday night, we're going for the glory. We're going for the glory. They had the Olympics going for the gold. We're going for the glory. We're going for the gold. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's speak the word this morning. Will you not, not revive us again? again? That, that your people, people may rejoice, rejoice in you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Yes, Lord. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Uh, Don and Doug, do you guys want to come take the offering this morning? Don, you want to ask the blessing, please? Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be here this morning, Lord. We just pray that our minds will be open, yes, and that yes, we will Lord. hear and absorb what you have for us to hear. Yes. Lord, we just pray that in these times that we live in, that we are alert and aware and conscious of what's going on. Yes, For you said if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived, but we thank God that it's not possible. Hallelujah. Lord, be with us today. Be with us every day. Praise your holy name. Now bless this offering, bless the remainder of the service, and we ask it in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus. Yes, we pray. Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. As the worship team gathers, let's prepare our heart as an offering of praise and worship. This morning we're going to declare the restoration that the Lord has put in our midst, the healing that the Lord has already put in our midst financial release that the Lord has already put in our midst and we haven't recognized it yet. We haven't seen it with our eyes yet, but it's happening. So let's worship him and glorify him for he alone 
is worthy.
Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Let's just love the Lord for a minute. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just bless you this morning. Thank you for all of your blessings, all of your goodness, all of your grace. Thank you for being you, Lord. We just praise you this morning. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a hand clap today. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Mike and uh, worship team. As always, thanks all of you for sharing your testimonies and prayer requests. Praise God. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just going to mention, uh, Sally's not here today. We've been dog setting and chicken setting for the last two days, and so we got to go back and forth to Prairie City twice a day to take care of the creatures down there while my daughter and her family are taking a few days off. So, so that's where Sally is, cleaning up after a mad dog that uh, got on their dining room table and ate up some of the second son's um, preschool stuff. So it's a wonderful animal. So she's having a great time, uh, back to nature. Praise God. I just wanted to uh, begin by mentioning, you know, when uh, Suzanne was uh, uh, speaking from uh, Zechariah chapter 4, I think what I want to talk to you about this morning, and I'm going to go back over some things we've already been over, so if, if I uh, seem kind of repetitious, but just that's the way it is. You'll have to deal with it, praise the Lord. But I still feel like there's something more uh, to that that I want to <coughs> share with you. But I think the key word there in chapter 4 in the second verse where he says, S whatever, what seest thou, you know? And that's that's key to everything. What, what do we see? I mean, what are we really, you know, looking at? You know, we... He goes on to say, I've, I've looked and behold a candlestick. And, of course, I know there's all kinds of metaphors and symbolism. We can do this till the sun goes down and comes up again and, and all of that. But the scripture says that you're, I mean, the scripture best defines the scripture. Uh, so the candlestick here, he says your spirit, in the, in the Psalms he says your spirit is the candle of the Lord. So we're, we know all these things point to Jesus. But at the same time, the spirit that we have in us illuminates the reality of God, not only to ourselves but to others. We talk about our, letting our light shine and so on and so forth. And, of course, the oil being the oil of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, olive trees represent there that there is a continuous supply. That we're never going to run out of the Holy Spirit to operate in, in our lives if we just allow it to flow through us. Amen. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was that as it – as he kind of sums up everything, see, this isn't, it isn't by human spirit, but it's by revelation of the word of God, which is Jesus. You know, you can look at that either way you want to because they're, they're synonymous terms. The, the word of God and Jesus are one. So he's telling us that this isn't by our abilities. It's by the spirit of God. It's by a revelation of who God is and how he operates in our lives. Amen. And he says, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, thou shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone, or the cornerstone, which is Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's how we shout, grace, grace. Praise the Lord. That's how we are able to, to come to God, amen, with that uh, revelation, come boldly to the throne of grace. And so I just want to reemphasize the fact that um, it's seeing is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with people that are in darkness, people that are blinded to the truth of God. We've heard that testi testify to today. Our job is to enlighten them. Our job is to light that up for them so that they can see, so they can see and have a revelation of God himself. Amen. So, you know, revelation of restoration. How many need a revelation of restoration. We need some stuff restored, right? How about a revelation of power? A revelation of healing? 
a revelation of uh, deliverance, a revelation of prosperity, a revelation of love. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ that makes all of that happen. He is our healer. He is our restorer. He is all of these things to us and to anyone else who can believe. See, we get born again, how? By believing Jesus Christ, the Word of God. That's revelation. You continue to grow in that salvation. You mature. You develop the same way by believing the revelation of Jesus Christ. The thing that gets you into this is the thing that propels you on into all that God has for your life. Praise the Lord. He says we renew our mind by the word of God. Putting on the mind of Christ. It isn't just memorizing scriptures. It's having revelation of Christ through those scriptures. This whole book is a revelation of Jesus Christ. Go to the book of Revelation and it's not a revelation of horrible things to come. Or flying, you know, bugs the size of Volkswagens or something. But it's. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's where our focus is supposed to be. Amen? So uh, you want God to speak to you? Praise the Lord. You need a self-revelation of the Word of God. You need a self, a personal revelation of Jesus. He's talking all the time. He, he, he isn't uh, shy about speaking to us. So we need a, a revelation of Jesus. If we want to hear from God. And right here is the key. And I'm not saying that God doesn't speak to us in a still small voice. Because he does. But he does it based on the principles and the truths of this word. So if you don't have this, it's going to be difficult to know when it's God, when it's you, or when it's just the enemy. So I want to, I want to go back over some things for that reason this morning. And let's begin with 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, verse 4. And these, I'll, I'll be repeating some scriptures that we've used over the last couple of weeks, but only because I think, you know, faith comes by hearing and by hearing and by hearing. And sometimes we just, you know, we hear things and we go, well, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, I believe that. And then the next day we're faced with something, we forget all about it. We're not applying the things that we do know. So in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So, again, let me just repeat it in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they need light. They need to be enlightened. They need the scales removed, like Paul. You know, they, they need to be able to see Christ. Amen? All right, so let's go to John chapter 1, and I want to read verses 1 through 9. You know, I think sometimes we... And I'm not against, I've got bookshelves full of books at home. And uh, I've, in fact, I've got more books than the bookshelves hold. I've got them stacked on tables upstairs in my little kind of, I could like to think of it as a man cave, but it's an upper man cave, praise the Lord. Just big screen TV and a bunch of books, hallelujah. I'm happy with it. But uh, nevertheless, I can't, I can't read them all. I mean, I, I will read them all eventually if I live long enough, but I don't have time to just you know, do that. So I've got books. I've read most of the books that I have. I, I have read the ones that are on the shelves anyway, the ones that are stacked on the table I haven't got to yet. But I'm just saying I can read all the books that there are that everybody has an opinion about that makes a, you know, a, a kind of a, this is my take on this particular thing. But this, this is the answer here. And I'm not against, you know, educating yourself and, and becoming, you know, uh, wiser in terms of reading other people's takes on the Bible. But, I mean, we, we, this is where we need to start and end. And anything that doesn't fit this, they just figure it's a waste of time. And so in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made was made. The Word. Everything was made by the Word of God. There wasn't Jesus out there making little, you know, clay you know, sandcastles or something. It, Jesus is the Word. Everything was created by Him, by the Word, amen? And that Word eventually becomes flesh, but the light shines in darkness, 
In him was life. The life was the light of men. The light shines in darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. We've all got a John mandate. We, we all have a, a, a purpose. And the purpose is to, to be a light that shines, you know, that, that reveals Jesus. Amen. We're not the light, but we are a light that comes from the light. Amen. He was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Praise the Lord. So, the Word of God, Scripture, the uh, Gospels are a manifestation, or they manifest by the way they give all glory to God. In other words, so that's what I'm saying, the difference between reading a man's book that is about the Bible and reading the Bible. This Word of God, the Gospel, manifests God. It reveals God. It, 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 it's a way that it gives all the glory to God. It isn't about the author. I mean, it is about the author, but not in terms of a, a, you know, a, a secular book or somebody else's writing about the Bible. This is all about God. And it gives all the glory to God. When you read it, that's what it's doing. It's, it, it, it manifests the glory of God. Amen? And we are, we're drawn by this, and it, it's, a, it's a dominant peculiarity, if you will, that the way God works this out, the way that he uh, brings glory or glorifies himself through the word of God. It will always elevate God. It will always magnify God. Amen? So God glorifies himself in Scripture. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter uh, 30 and verse 18. So a lot of times we're looking for the miraculous. We're looking for the supernatural. We're looking for, you know, God to manifest. And we forget that this is the means by which he does it. So in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, he says, Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you, and therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. Praise God. Isaiah 40 and verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, right? For though through the voice of the Lord shall their... No, that's not it. It's Isaiah 30. Isaiah 40, 31, I'm sorry. But anyway, we know the scripture. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They, uh, they shall run, they shall not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. By waiting on the Lord. Amen. So, praise the Lord. God manifests himself by working for those who wait for him. Who wait on the Lord. And I'm not talking like waiting tables or serving. I'm talking about resting, yes. trusting, waiting for God to do what only God can do. Praise the Lord. So through fulfilled prophecy, God does this. He does it through miracles. He does it through signs and wonders. He does it through manifestation of what his word promises. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, when Paul is talking about, and you can go there, Sheila, when Paul is talking about this Little by little, we are transformed. This, uh, by degrees, we are transformed. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Open face, beholding or seeing in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the glory of what we see in the Word creates a glory in a way that we see the world. You can tell somebody about Jesus and they can be saved, but it's through the glory of this world word that we perceive the world that we live in. Yes. So if you don't have this, what you're seeing in the world, you don't know what it is. Is it real? Is it not real? Is it true? Is it, should I be afraid? Should I you know, respond? Should I be aggressive about this? What should I do? 
It's, it's how you see the world that makes a difference. And if you're seeing it through the eyes of God or through the scriptures, you have some power. You have some ability. You have some resource. But if you're just seeing the world as the world is, well, sorry, but you've got a problem. I mean, we're, we're in big trouble. Amen? We are transformed by seeing. See, beholding is believing. And believing is becoming. Yes. I mean, you are what you believe you are. Yes. If that weren't the case, we wouldn't need psych psychiatrists. <laughs> you know, somebody to build up our ego and make us feel better about ourselves or whatever. Yeah. The nature of transformation is shaped by the nature of what is seen. So the na how we are, that's what Paul's saying. The nature of, of how we are transformed is based on the nature of what it is we're looking at. Praise the Lord. So we see the glory of the Lord, and we're changed from one degree of glory to the next. Praise the Lord. In other words, the Word of God, the Gospel, exhibits the glory of God in Christ. And then it creates an exhibition of the glory of God in those who see it and believe it. That's the difference between somebody just picking this up and reading it and saying, well, you know, I don't believe any of that. And someone who sees the glory of God begins to be transformed by that vision, by that image, by that reality. Amen? So, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, again, talking about the blindest being blinded. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Now drop down to verse 6. Or five and six, I don't care, just as long as six is on there. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For those of us who are alive today, we haven't seen, we haven't seen Christ face to face, have we? I mean, I don't imagine you have. You may have had a vision or something, but I doubt it. We haven't seen him. Right? We know of him, but we haven't seen him face to face. So the sight of his glory is mediated by words because we don't have a face to look at. And we're always talking about beholding the Lord. You know, focus on Jesus. And people are going, How? you know what? Is a picture, is, is there some actual semblance of him somewhere that I can look at besides the icons that the churches have built over the years? No. We don't know, we don't have a, you know, a, a, a accurate description of what he looked like, so we can't even make a picture in our mind other than just a, an imaginary kind of dreamlike thing that we're looking at. But I'm saying that because we aren't seeing him face to face, we haven't ever seen him face to face, he reveals himself, he shows us his face, amen, he shows us his glory by words. He mediates it by the word of God, by this, they're one and the same. Amen? So th that's the gospel. That's the truth. Jesus, the word of God. He is the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, right? So that's, that's what he's trying to show us. So now 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you find eternal life. But, and they are they which speak of me, but you won't. Why? Because they're not seeing Jesus in the scripture. They're seeing their religion. They're seeing the rules, they're seeing the regulations, but they're not seeing the Word of God manifest. They're not seeing the reality of Christ. They're not beholding His face in a glass. Right. So they're not being transformed. They're just trying to do what this thing says. Amen? For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Praise the Lord. 23 through 25. So we didn't get saved by stuff. We got saved by the word of God. Hallelujah. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is as grass. All the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospels is preached unto you. Praise the Lord. So the principle is this. 
When God speaks, God himself stands out for those who have eyes to see. When he's speaking, he's showing himself. So when he says, by my stripes, you're healed, you need to see the healer. Right? You need to see yourself healed because he's the healer. Amen? 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 21. And this is throughout the scripture. I'm just, I'm just using this to get us to understand when we're talking about seeing. I mean, a lot of times we're thinking, man, I got to have a vision. I got to have a dream. I got to have. And that, nothing wrong with any of those. We, 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 we're excited about that. But he's talking about seeing him. He's talking about seeing him in the word of God, not some, you know, ethereal kind of vaporish kind of thing that might happen or might not happen. This is for real. This is settled. This is done. And I don't need a translation. You know, I don't need somebody to interpret this for me. A dream I may need. You know, I, I, and then I'm dependent on somebody else to tell me what God's trying to tell me. Right. Now I got their business in my business. And I don't know how much of it's for God and how much of it's just us, you know. So the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh. How did he reveal himself to Samuel in Shiloh? By the word of God. Yes. By the word of the Lord. Yes. You want a revelation? It's right here. It's right here. And God will take you right to where he wants to speak to you from. And in fact, he can tell you anything he wants from anywhere in this thing. You may think you've got to get to the I'm telling you, it's all Jesus. And if you're, if you're open to what Jesus is saying and what he's trying to get us to see, you'll be a recipient. You will receive. And you will see the glory of God. Amen. So the Lord appeared again to Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh, and he did it by the word of God. And church, I'm telling you this morning, this is how self-revelation happens. Yes. You can go through all the other stuff, and I'm not saying that other, there aren't other ways that God shows himself to people, that he manifests himself. But it's all through the word of God. Because if you don't have a revelation of the word of God, no matter what God does, you're not going to see it anyhow. Praise the Lord. How many people every day, sinners, lost people, unsaved, rejecting God, are blessed by God every single day? God's moving it all the time. He's here everywhere. His grace is on this whole planet, not just on those of us that believe. Do they ever see it? No. Praise the Lord. So that's, this is self-revelation. It happens by the word of God. We see the Lord by the word of the Lord. How else are you going to know him? How else would you ever define him? How else would you ever know how to follow him? How else would you ever know what he wanted you to do if you couldn't ever see him, if you, if you couldn't ever identify with this reality? I'm not trying to dumb things down, and I'm certainly not trying to be unspiritual, but we have spiritualized everything but this. And this is where the Spirit is, is leading us and guiding us to and through. So in all of our getting, let's get the Lord. I mean, let's get God. Praise God. That's how Paul understands beholding the glory of the Lord in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. If you go back there, Sheila, that's what, he's, that's what he's trying to show us in this little capsule. We all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what I've been saying is what Paul just says in that one, because he can say it a lot better. Amen. He can say it in just one little mouthful, everything I'm stumbling around up here for an hour trying to say, or 45 minutes or however long it takes. Amen. But that's how Paul understands beholding in a glass. Yes. Amen. You can, you can see it over and over from the way that Paul describes this self-revelation, the glory of the Lord. He, he describes the self-revelation, the glory of the Lord, in terms of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Are you still with me out there? Praise yeah. the Lord. I'm, I'm not trying to be confusing here, but you know, so I can only say it the way I can think it, you know. And I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm trying to say is that this revelation, this glory of the Lord, Paul says this is how it happens. This is how we see it. Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, again, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It can't be any clearer or simpler, in my mind at least, 
what Paul's talking about here. The apostles, other people that lived in that day, they saw Jesus face to face. They walked with him. They talked with him. They ate with him. They, 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 you know, they were all in business together. They were, they were together all the time. They saw him face to face. Moses said, God, show me your face. God said, I can't show you my face. Because it hadn't been manifested yet in the person of Jesus Christ, not bodily. So he said, I can't show you. But I'll show you my hinder parts. I'll show you what the glory can do. I'll show you what the glory is. Uh -huh. So he hides him in the cleft of the rock. How many know Jesus? The rock. So he shows him, but he, show, he can't show him face to face, but he, he gives him a picture anyway. He, he says, see this? Here's, here's, here's the glory. It's as close as you're going to get. Yeah. Praise God. So they all saw the glory, the, the, the apostles. They, they saw the glory of the Lord face to face. John 1.14. Sometimes we, you know, we, we want a spiritual encounter so bad. So we're so desperate for this that we're crying out for visions, you know, for, for dreams. And all the time God has said, my glory is, is right before you. Mm. Those things, I'm not, I'm not against them and I'm not criticizing and I'm not, you know, putting you down if you're, you know, wanting those things. Everybody wants more, you know, and that's okay. But, but the truth is, that's Old Testament stuff. That's Old Covenant. You can, tell, you can talk about it any way you want to, but the truth is they had to have those things because they had no spirit of God dwelling in them. Exactly. So they had to have something, something physical, something, something they could see, something they could hear with their ears. We're not, hey, we've got eyes to see, and we're not seeing. Yeah. And why? Because we're looking for a vision or a dream instead of going by what the Spirit is leading us and telling us we should do. You've got the Word of God in you. You've got Christ in you. We're one. Yes. Come on. And, and we act as if he's still off on a yes. planet someplace and we're waiting for him to show up. Yes. He's, he showed up. Yes. And he showed out. And we need to be responsive. You know, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So they saw him. They saw him face to face, right? But there's a contradiction, and I just was speaking of that. There's a contradiction between religion and the glory of God. And we, thump, some, for some reason, we get it in our heads sometimes that the, the religious aspect of this, and I mean that's the, the visions, the dreams, the, the so on and so forth, are more important than the spiritual which is Christ. There's a, it, it creates a contradiction is what it does. Amen. So uh, John chapter 5, verse 44. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Now, again, we are, you know, we, we have a tendency to glorify people because they have, they give us information that we didn't have before or they give it to us in a way that we never received it before. And the problem is we can believe that, but we don't believe this. I mean, we can believe somebody else's interpretation of their revelation instead of just believing the revelation. How can you believe when you receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Yes. So we're, we're honoring, and I, I, again, I, you know, I, I'm sure I'll be misunderstood by somebody, but that's fine, because that's what I do, praise the Lord. <laughs> I make a point to be misunderstood. But I'm saying we, we honor what men do yeah. rather than God. And he's telling us that you can't, you, you can't operate that way. It doesn't work. How can you really believe if you're putting the emphasis on the latest book that's out or the latest guy that's doing this or doing that or has had some success, again, I'm not putting him down. I'm not being, I'm not jealous about him. I'm happy for anybody that's doing anything for Jesus. But I want Jesus. I don't want them. I don't want their twist on it. I want Christ. I want that to be the reality. I don't want to seek the honor of 
people, amen, or give honor to people rather than to give it to God where it belongs, to, to, to God who alone, amen, can bring glory into any situation or any circumstance, amen. James chapter 1, verse 18. Paul dealt with this in the very first century. He said, you, well, this one says, I'm of Apollos, I'm of this one, and I'm of that. And he said, hey, look, I didn't baptize anybody. I'm glad I didn't, or you'd be all chasing me. And that's why he goes on to say, if you're following me, just follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following this, if I'm not in this, then don't bother. That's right. yeah. Amen. So of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Yeah. How did we get... Born again. It wasn't Apollos. It wasn't Cephas. It wasn't this one or that one. It was Jesus. It was the Word of God. So let's keep the emphasis on the Word of God and quit worrying about chasing everybody else. If you can get something from other people's writings, fine. But that's that isn't where we're. That's not what we're after. You know, I I really just want a grander and a more succinct, more complete revelation of Jesus. And I want it for me because somebody else's never satisfies me. It makes me just hungrier for more of Jesus. And that's what it ought to do. That's the positive side of it. But if I can be satisfied with some person, some human's you know, reality, then I'm not getting everything that God wants me to have. I'm not, I'm not rising up to the stature of the, uh, the full stature of Jesus Christ that he tells me that I can be and should. Because I'm settling for... Joe Schmo, or somebody else, praise the Lord. Praise God. So we're the new creatures, born again by the word of truth. This is what Paul's talking about in Galatians when he says, you know, having begun in the spirit and so forth. So I'm not going to go through all of that again, but the traditions, he says in another place, I think in, in Mark and, and in Matthew, he says the traditions of men make the word of God ineffective. He says that we receive from men and don't receive from God. And that's why the things that we receive from men are so short-lived and never measure up to the real need that a person has. Exactly. It may be a pat on the back. You know, it's okay, we love you, it's all good. But it doesn't change things just more information. The effectiveness of the word depends on our being freed from the pride that values men's revelations or attitudes or just simply valuing man more than God. So back to John 5, 44. It says we how can you believe? We should receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from God only. That deception is religion. It's the praise of man and it's got to be removed. It has to be removed before we can see the glory of God. Just telling you the truth. Yeah. Amen. As long as you, you know, as long as as long as man is elevated, God isn't. Right. And I'm not mean. I, I'm not being. I don't mean to be disrespectful or or not take advantage of the things that God has made available to us. But God has to have the priority. If I find anything that disagrees with God, I don't need it. I don't want it. I got enough of that. The world is full of that. We, we need to embrace the reality of God in us. Yes. It's like the, the young man was talking about in, in the little video clip here at the beginning. It's not complicated. Religion makes it complicated. Right. It makes it all about all kinds of things, rituals and rites and all these different things. It's not, a, it's not about any of that. Jesus came to turn it all upside down. I said Wednesday night. We, we spent our 
90% of our Christian life on defense. Right. Trying to figure out what it is I can't do. What, what, what else am I not supposed to be doing? What else don't I do? And you know, it's all, we're, never, we're, we're never moving forward. We're always hunkered down somewhere trying to figure out how am I going to get more, a, a bigger flak jacket, you know, a, a, a larger helmet, more, more, more sandbags around me or something so the enemy can't get me. We're, the enemy is supposed to be defeated. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church if the church would just be the church. Amen? So here's, here's what I'm saying. You know, cliche, I probably got it backwards, but this is still works in this particular case. The best defense is a good offense. Make the devil run. Make the devil hide. Make him deal. Make him deal with you instead of you having to deal with him all the time. You've got the authority. You have the power. You just have to operate in it. Praise the Lord. So how can you believe which receive honor one of another instead of God? Amen. We need to be freed from that kind of human pride. Yep. See, it's uh, what is it that keeps people blind? Well, Paul said that they're deceived, right? And, of course, we'd all agree they must be deceived or they'd know the truth, right? What, what is it that overcomes deception or lies? Truth. Amen. Truth. Not somebody's latest gimmick, but the truth. Amen. What overcomes the deception of the enemy when it comes to other people is the truth. Jesus Christ, the word of God. Yeah. That's, the, that's our weapon. It isn't all the other stuff. It isn't all the other kind of Christian things that we've gotten into. It's the word. And I'm not against the stuff, you know, I mean, but I'm just saying. The stuff without the word, without Jesus, is just stuff. Uh-huh. Praise the Lord. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. the light of the world. Cities set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Mm-hmm. And that good works is not talking about, again, I've mentioned this before, but it's not just doing nice things, it's not just being a good person. Although we should be good people, that's not what he's referring to here. Remember when they said, good master, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? Right. I want to know what your definition of good is here. Yeah. Because right. there's only one that's good. Uh-huh. Now, are you saying that you recognize that I'm God in the flesh, that I'm your Messiah? Or are you just saying you're doing some nice stuff and I, I want to appreciate that? Right? right? So the good works, good works are not just nice things that we do. Good works are the works of God. The supernatural, the miraculous, what God wants to do in this world, and he needs a human being to operate through. But he needs one that can see. Obviously, if you're in deception, if you're blinded by the God of this world, you're not of any value to God in terms of what he's trying to do in the world. You have value. Everybody has value, intrinsic value. God loves the, uh, all the world, right? We're all part of his creation, and he wants us all to be saved. But as an unbeliever, you're not do- you can't do anything for God. And sadly, for much of the believing world, they're not doing anything for God either. They're doing something for their religion. No glory in it. People don't see glory in religion. They need to see the face of Jesus Christ. In other words, they need to see the glory of God. And the only way you do that is through truth. It's by understanding the revelation of God in Christ, and that fact that he is now in you makes you a carrier, an ambassador, whatever, however you want to define it. It makes you someone who can present the light to people who are in darkness. Thank you, Lord. So, the light of the world, cities hit, sit on a hill, hit on, uh, set on a hill, cannot be hid. Neither do men put a, a light a candle, put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and give light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, let me ask you this. 
How, how is anybody going to see uh, my God works if I don't do anything? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> well, first of all, we know that we're not going to see it here because they're not here. Right? right? So somewhere, we got to get to doing what this guy on the video was doing. I can just do it with that. And you can't do it here. I mean, we can do it here, but it becomes redundant. Because we're already believers. Right. Where it needs to be done is Walmart. Yes. Right? Where it needs to be done is Fairway. Yes. Where it needs to be done is wherever we are. Exactly. We lay hands on the sick and they recover. Yes. We share the love of God. Amen. By loving people. Yes. And don't misunderstand. I was talking about this Wednesday night and I think people, they, they think it's this warm, cuddly, romantic kind of love. That's not what we're talking about. No. Love is a decision. For God so loved the world. I don't know if God got a warm fuzzy when he said that or thought, but he made a decision. He, this is his. He's going to love it. Yes. And so he pours himself out in order for the world to see that. Yes. Yes. Come on. Now, he's made us his body. Yes. Yes. Let's just use a little rational common sense here. How do you suppose we're going to do this? The only template we have is Jesus. The only way that we can do it is to do what Jesus did. And that shouldn't be hard because we have Christ in us. Right? Exactly. Now, <laughs> it could be a little embarrassing. You know, you could, you know, be put off by some people. But based on what I've read in the Bible, a lot of people were put off by Jesus, too. Exactly. And they were looking for a reason. You can't, you can't be doing that in a fair way, Suzanne. You know, you can't do this on the Sabbath. That's not, that's not within our religious paradigm here, you know. Right. Sure. That's what I was talking about, again, Wednesday night, flipping this whole thing the way Jesus did. He, he turned everything upside down. And it didn't take the disciples too long to turn it the other way around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, not, maybe not the first century disciples, but soon after. They flipped the world upside down, all right, but right back to the mess it was in before yeah. Jesus had showed up. Yeah. So I'm just saying... We have to be willing. Now, everybody's different. I mean, not everybody is gregarious and outgoing and, and bold and so forth. But listen, God will put people in your path every day that you can work. You don't maybe have to get down on your hands and knees and lay hands on them, but you can put your arm around them. You can say, look, let's pray. Yes. Or can I pray for you? Yes. And 90% of the time they'll say yes. And if they don't, thank God you've been persecuted for Jesus. You know, you got to, it's a good thing, yes. right? But all of us encounter people every day, sometimes in our family, outside of our family, where Jesus is wanting to be released. Yes. He's wanting to be manifest. Yes. He's wanting the glory of God to be revealed. And it's the only way it can happen. Amen. See, when he said, I give you authority, I go away, because if I don't go away, I can't send back the Spirit. And the Spirit needs to come because He can lead you and guide you. And we're still crying out for the one who's already in us. I mean, we have entire meetings that are about, I'm, I say we, I just mean Christianity, about getting God to come. Well, if there's a believer out there, He's already shown up. He's already arrived. He's already here. And He's not going to do anything absent us. He's already told us, I'm giving you authority. Yes. It's up to you now. Yes. So you can quit crying out for a burning bush, you know, or, you know, some other vision in the sky and just realize you are that vision. Yeah. You are that means by which God wants to manifest his glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. And praise him. Amen. Let's go to John 8, chapter 12, or John 8, verse 12. And that, you know, one of, the, one of the problems with this is as long as we see it as a, uh, something external from us, there'll always be a reason to wait. You know, it's something else is getting put into place. If there is a time 
fullness of time. The fullness of time is depending on us. The fullness of time could be tomorrow if the church rose up and started doing what God called them and created them to be and to do. So, you know, we always are looking for an excuse, I guess. Or, you know, I mean, I think it's honest intellectually to say that, you know, well, we're, because we're not seeing it, there must be something else that needs to happen. And the something else that needs to happen is us. Come on. The something else that needs to happen for the glory of God to fill the earth the way the water covers the sea is for the church to start being a revelation of Jesus. So they spake Jesus again and said unto them, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So the disciples, they, they beheld the glory, right? They saw him. They told us that in John 1. He said, we beheld the glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word of God was the light of the world, and it became flesh. And the disciples basically are saying they, they beheld the glory of the Lord. They've been changed from one degree of glory to another into his image. And Jesus then calls them light. That's how we know they beheld the glory. They followed. And Jesus then declares that they are light. He tells us the same thing. We have beheld the glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father. The word of God made flesh. We didn't see the flesh, but we saw the reality. We still see the word of God. We still have it. We still have the means by which we can be the light of the world. That's what he's talking about when he says, you don't hide, uh, you know, if you got a light, you don't stick it under a bushel. That would be idiotic, wouldn't it? I mean, if you need light, why would you cover it up? Uh -huh. right. But that's, that is a picture of the church. Yeah. Having the light of the world in us and hiding under a bushel basket. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And all the time saying we're looking for the glory. Yeah. So these disciples become light. They, they, they get transformed by beholding Jesus, by seeing Jesus, the Word of God, right? He declares them then to be light because they have been in the light. They've received the light. And now what are they doing? They're extending the glory that they've seen in the world by the transformation of their lives. That's how it's done. Does that make sense to you? That's how the world sees it. Yes. Not about us being perfect and, you know, in a religious sense that we never go here or never do that or never have this. All that is just bunk anyway. Most of 90% of that stuff is just a way of controlling people, not a way of giving them freedom or, or into a relationship with Jesus. It's the pride of man trying to manipulate and control. Jesus, Jesus was fun to be with. Amen? Come on. Now, you can see they, they enjoyed life. They, he wanted to give us life and that more abundantly. Yeah. He wants us to experience this life and enjoy it. But he also wants us to shine. Amen. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know what your thing is, where you go, what you do, what your favorite pastimes are. But you've got people of like interest yeah. right there, at your, you know, right at your disposal. Yeah. Right. So you can share with them. Amen? Imagine what it would be like. Think of the, uh, the people that, uh, that have uh, drinking problems. I mean, serious drinking problems. I've never had a problem with it. It's always easy for me. But I'm saying, you know, I'm people that have addictive personalities that are really, it creates destructive behavior and all kinds of things. Suppose you could just sit down and have a, a beer with them. Tell them what God really wants for their life, what God is wanting to do in their life. Not absent the alcohol, but just as you are. Don't worry about that. Let's, let's let God take care of that. Let's just love them in the midst of that. Yes. See, we've got a problem with that because we think that means we're endorsing it. No. Well, was Jesus endorsing pro prostitution? No. Was he endorsing alcoholism? No. Was he endorsing, uh, you know, uh, uh, gluttony? No. 
But he was accused of all of it because he ate, he drank, and he was friends with prostitutes. And those people were drawn to him like a magnet. Yes. Come on. Yes. Why? Because they were accepted. Yes. They thought maybe there is a hope. Maybe there yes. is a way. Maybe yes. there is some yes. something in God that still cares about me. Maybe, maybe my life isn't a total waste. Maybe I'm not as despicable as I believe myself to be and that others have declared me to be. That's called love. Yes. If we had a child and that child was bound up in drug abuse or alcoholism, and most of us have been down this road, either ourselves or we've had family men or friends or whatever, uh, into a, you know, a, an illicit relationship, a bad situation. And, and our, do, do we just say, well, that, that's it. Don't come back around here. Don't come around this place again until you got your junk together. And I mean, I want to know, I don't want to be smelling cigarette smoke on your breath. I don't want to be smelling alcohol. I don't even want any really strong perfume because that might lead me to believe you're on the make, you know? No. We would love them in all of that mess, and we would do everything we could to help them to see the value that they have, the value that we see in them and the value they should see in themselves. Amen. We're not writing you off because you've got issues. We're loving you all the more because you got issues. Welcome to the human race. Everybody's got issues. Yours are just more visible than mine. Come on. That's what Jesus was doing. How hard is that? Didn't cost us a thing for them to be saved. Right. Just a moment or two to say, you know what? You're all right. You're okay. You got some issues. We all got issues. But God can help you with yours the same way he helps me with mine. And he wants to. And in the meantime, don't beat yourself up over it. Just love God. Just trust God. Let God love you. And see how, see how it plays out. Yes. Uh -huh. Are they going to be worse off? No. I mean, they're already in a mess, so what are you doing? You're, you're just, it isn't like you're giving them the stamp of approval to be in a mess, but you're telling them, I'm going to love you in the mess anyhow because God wants you out of the mess. Amen. And he can't get you out of the mess if all he's doing is yelling and screaming at you all the time because uh -huh. all you want to do is get away then. Praise God. So that's what they were doing. They were extending the glory that they'd seen in the world. Now, they saw it in the world, <laughs> praise God, based on what they saw in the spirit. Yes. Yep. Again, it's being transformed. They saw Jesus. They were seeing what he was doing. They saw him in the world. Yeah. And it changed the way they looked at the entire world from that point on. Yes. By beholding him. It changed their vision of everything else. Amen. See, we, what happens in religion is we behold religion. And it makes us angry at everybody else because they're getting to do stuff we can't. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, I mean, we get angry because you know, we're restricted and they're not. Mm -hmm. It's so bogus. It's just so unscriptural. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Let no man judge you. Uh -huh. yeah. Praise the Lord. Matthew 5.16. Again, a good works. It's God works. Jacob, you got Joseph? The son? No, that's not going to work. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your God works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light shine the way Jesus' light shines. Uh -huh. And people will see God. Yes. So like the miracles that Jesus performed, the disciples did their good works, which were representations of that same works, right? He said, go out, heal sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. Amen? Amen? Nothing's changed. We're still supposed to be doing that. Matthew 5, 13 through 14. Okay. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt had lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. 
a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. So Jesus is telling us the same thing he told the disciples. You've seen the light, now you are the light. So let your light shine. How you see it is how you reflect it. So how you see Christ is how you see the world. Which tells me, and I, I, again, I'm not talking about anybody in here because everybody here is perfect. There's all kinds of messed up people out there. And I've seen this. He says, how you see him is how you see the world. And we've made it about how you see your religion is how you see the world. So we're angry at everybody. And everybody's angry at us. So we've lost our, we've lost our uh, ability to influence. Because they immediately think they've got an agenda. They want to get me to that church so I, they can get my money. Or they want a feather in their hat. So they can say, yeah, this guy was the worst mess I've ever seen before. But we want him to Jesus and he's all right now. He's got it all together now. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the light that moves people to give glory to God is not just good works, but it's, it's works that are done with dependence on Jesus. Because yeah. you can do works all day long, and they don't mean sick of them. If it's just you doing it for whatever, you know, to get the gold star, to get your name in the book, or whatever it is. But to do it in Christ, yes. now it has eternal impact. It has eternal yes. effect. Yes. Praise the Lord. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, verse 5 through 11. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That'd be a good place to start, wouldn't it? <laughs> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Amen? The Father. Praise the Lord. So, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul said, you have the mind of Christ, put on the mind of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is Christ in you, right? right. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. <clears throat> Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now I'm going to go ahead and read on because I know it's difficult to jump chapters for you sometimes, Sheila. But be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. This is chapter 5, verse 1. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. There's Christianity right there. Faith works by love. Praise the Lord. And that's where you see the glory of God exhibited in the lives of believers. If faith works by love, I don't need as much emphasis put on my faith as I do on my love. Faith will just follow. It'll come. It'll come on its own. Signs and wonders and miracles will take place. Because faith works by love. Yes. For God so loved yes. that he did the greatest miracle of all. Amen. And it hasn't stopped. Amen. And again, I'm not talking about feeling good about everybody. You can love people you don't like. And we all know that because we've got family members. <laughs> <laughs> we love them, but there are times we don't like them. Uh, right? They're acting crazy. They're being goofy. They're, they're stirring up trouble. They're creating strife and all kinds, but we still love them because they're family, and we're going to keep on loving them in hopes that at some point we'll actually like them. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. And that's not, I'm not being disrespectful to family. I come from a big family, so I know. There are days you can love the life out of them, but just you just soon take the life out of them because you don't like them at that point because they're just being crazy. Yeah. 
But we, we don't have to feel all warm and fuzzy and cuddly. You can be put off by the things that they're involved in, by their behavior, and it can, can, it can bother you. But you can still love them. Just think of it the way God made it look to him. They're my children. That's how he sees us. They're my children. So I'm going to love them. No matter how screwed up they are, no matter how much they reject me and create problems, I'm still going to love them. And you can bet God doesn't like all the stuff that he sees, but he still loves us. And we can operate the same way or he wouldn't be telling us to do it. If he hadn't empowered us to do it, he wouldn't have asked us to do it. Praise the Lord. So, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4. <clears throat> We're about to wrap up here. So. Ephesians 3, 4. Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So, this, this, here's the question. This is what Paul's saying. He's, this, is still, he's still, this is still in the context of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and 4, 6. All of the, I mean, the, there weren't any, you know, the, the mind, it wasn't like he was believing one thing one day and then he hops off to something else a year later. No, the, the totality of his belief, of his knowing, is captured in every letter that he writes, in all that he says. It's, 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 it's uh, consistent, amen? So he says, whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. When you read what? Capper's Weekly? <laughs> this. Yes. So that when you read this, you'll understand what I know yes. about the mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. That's Paul's invitation. That's Paul's declaration. That's what he's telling us. So how does, how does revelation, knowledge, that's gained by beholding the glory of the Lord, Revelation knowledge that's, that's gained by beholding the glory of the Lord. How, how does that relate to knowledge gained by logical, intellectual inference? It doesn't. How, how does knowledge of daylight gained by seeing the sun relate to knowledge of daylight gained by the other senses? Like I feel the warmth on my skin. Or I hear a clock striking. Right? Mm -hmm. Or I hear other people saying, oh, sun's shining today, a beautiful day, isn't it, with the sun? It's still different. It's still not the same as me seeing the sun. Yeah. Right. I'm having to take somebody else's word for it. I'm having to believe that what they're saying is true rather than what I'm actually seeing. God reveals the truth of his word to our hearts, and he does it by the sight of his glory. Yes. we got to get these, this, you know, I mean, we're always talking about eyes to see and ears to hear, but, I mean, that's what Paul's explaining to us. Yes. He reveals the truth yes. to our heart, and he does it by the sight of his glory. Look, I'm all about signs and wonders, and I, I, I love all that stuff, but look, it wouldn't mean anything without this. Because right. just like what Don's earlier, in the last days, the, the devil, if it were possible, he'd deceive the very elect. Yeah. And how's he going to do it? Signs and wonders? Yeah. There, there'll be all kinds of stuff going on, and, he'll, and everybody will be going, like, it must be God, because look, it's a miracle. What they see is what they're going to get because they haven't seen the glory. So they're seeing the world through the eyes of the world instead of seeing the world through the eyes of the glory of God. Galatians chapter 1, 23 through 24. So look and be transformed. They had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preached the, gospel, preached the faith which once he destroyed and they glorified God in me. That's Paul talking about himself. They heard about him, but all they knew about him was that he'd been killing Christians and having them thrown in jail and dispossessed and all sorts of other things. He preached the faith that he once destroyed. 
And what did they do? They glorified God in me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Paul beheld the glory, and then he gave everybody a look. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Look what I've seen. See what I see. Uh -huh. I'm going I'm to close with this, and this may sound bizarre, but when I was working on this message over the last week, I was driving <coughs> to uh, Prairie City, and I had on Sirius XM, and it happened to be Elton John. But this is how God will speak to you, too. Yes, that's good. And there's a song. I'm not a huge Elton John fan. <laughs> Love his glasses, but <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but he had this song. The song was playing. And it just like, it was almost like God speaking out loud to me. Uh -huh. The song is called Mona Lisa and Mad Hatters. You know it had to come from heaven. But it goes, just one little verse that caught my ear. Sons of lawyers, sons of doctors, they say good morning in the night. Unless they see the sky, they know not if it's day or night. Mm -hmm. And that is the world we live in. Walking around saying good morning when it's night. Because uh -huh. they don't know if it's day or because they're blinded by the deceiver. And God wants us to be the one to say, look up, your redemption draweth nigh. There's the sun, there's the light, and it's for you. Can you give the Lord a hand clap this morning? Praise God. So the, 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 the highest intellectuals, to the lowest, the most handsome, the most beautiful, to the not so much, can do the same thing. You can love people, you can show them the light, and they can see the glory of God yes. and be transformed. It's that simple. It's not complex. It's not complicated. We don't need a, a three-week seminar to figure this out. We do it just like we do everyday life. Just look around and choose to love. And let a little love go. Amen. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here today. Have a great rest of the week, and we'll hope to see you back here Wednesday.